I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me here and for organizing this really nice conference. So uh, the topic today is fluke engineering of quantum scars, and this is a um, result of work that has been done with Bhaskar Mukherjee, who is my graduate student. Saurav Nandi, who was working with Arnav Shen at IACS and now a postdoc at IIT Bombay, who is in the audience. Uh, Arnab, who is my colleague at IACS, and Dipti Manshen, who is a faculty at IISC uh, Bangalore. And if you want more details, here is the archive, the first part of the talk. Uh, so here is a brief outline. First, I'm going to introduce the problem and talk about uh, very briefly on some experiment on Rydberg chains, which motivated this problem. And then we are going to talk about periodic dynamics of, driven, uh, of a driven Hamiltonian, which goes by the name of dipole model. And I'm going to uh, motivate uh, why we are studying this by appealing to the fact that uh, this model uh, is uh, similar to the one which describes the low energy properties of this Rydberg chain, uh, atoms on a Rydberg chain. And then we are going to see that, uh, so we are going to sort of derive the Fluke Hamiltonian for this periodic drive and see that, uh, uh, that these model indeed supports something called quantum scars and their role in the dynamics is the main as, uh, topic of this study. In particular, we are going to see that there are reentrant transitions or crossover because these are finite size systems between coherent and thermal regimes in this drive and that's uh, due to the presence or absence of these quantum scars. And then if I have time, I'm going to talk about drive with random period and show how these considerations generalize in that case. And uh, that's the brief outline. So let me try to introduce this uh, subject. So suppose we try to consider the evolution of a quantum state for a non-integrable many-body system and ask the question that how would the expectation value of a typical local operator, and I'm not going to define this in generality, but just think of a local operator of some sort, uh, behave at long times. Now this answer to this question requires understanding properties of the matrix element of such operators between any two eigenstates of the system in the energy basis. And our understanding of that is provided by this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, or ETH, which tells you that it's uh, the answer for these matrix elements is almost same as what is obtained using a microcanonical ensemble at some average energy, which is given by uh, EM and plus EN by two. And the long time average value is the uh, value of such operators, such typical local operators would be same as that obtained from microcanonical ensemble. And by equivalence of ensembles, this also means that uh, we can associate a temperature to this. Like an, because I come to think, thought about this in terms of a canonical ensemble and say that the long time average values is described by a temperature, which means that the system would thermalize. So the basic property, if ETH holds, what you would expect for such evolution is that the system after some typical thermalization time, which depends on system time scales and depends on details, is going to get into a thermal steady state. However, there are known examples of violation of ETH. One of them is uh, for integrable models where, uh, you know, it simply doesn't work because uh, you break ergodicity because of this concept quantities. And then there are many body localization uh, systems which are many body localized where lack of ergodicity is due to strong disorder. But today what I'm going to talk about is violation of ETH due to presence of a special class of eigenstates in the Hilbert space of the Hamiltonian uh, leading to long time coherent oscillatory dynamics. Here, this, here the quantum coherence is maintained over really long times and which is much beyond what ETH would predict. And these states are the quantum scars. And so let me try to introduce what these scars are. Yeah. Yes, but let's not get on. I'm not talking about MDL, so just, yeah. So, uh, so this classical, so scars are well known from classical context. For example, if you take this Vamsovich stadium and uh, you know, if, uh, if you consider trajectories of a ball which is moving classically in the stadium, for most initial condition, the trajectories are going to fill up the entire phase space. But there are certain trajectories for which you are not going to fill up the space. Okay, so those are examples of classical scars. However, this can be generalized to simple quantum mechanical uh, context. So the quantum mechanical version of this problem arises when you look at a quantum billiard problem where, uh, you know, uh, you just 
create this Pamsovi stadium as the potential for that problem. And you could try to compute the probability distribution of a Gaussian wave packet which is centered around these classical trajectories. And if you look at the long time probability uh, distribution of this wave packet, you see that there are these Carl like patterns. And so the point is that there could be existence of non uniform distribution at long times due to presence of special set of Eigen functions in the uh, Hamiltonian of this uh, quantum mechanical problem. And uh, it turns out that the probability amplitude of those Eigen function <coughs> peaks around the classical periodic orbits, and those are cards in context of quantum mechanics. But in quantum many body systems, scars are essentially uh, states which have finite energy density, but other properties of them are athermal, meaning that suppose you take such a state and you construct a density matrix out of them, and then you integrate out half the system, okay, and compute what is called the half chain entanglement entropy corresponding to the density of state. Typically for a state with finite energy density, what you would expect is that such half chain entanglement entropy would be thermal, meaning that it would have a volume law behavior. Here they are not. So these states have finite energy density, but they have a thermal behavior when it comes to, for example, half chain entanglement entropy. So there are many examples of this. So for example, in the AKLT spin chain, the Rydberg chain, which I'm going to discuss, and many other systems, people have now looked into these cars. Now, if you ask me why do they occur, the answer is I don't really know. The general conditions required for their existence, I think, is still unknown. People are working on that, but I don't know if there is a uh, consensus on that. Uh, of course, in AKLT spin chains, their existence is analytically proven. And this, the important part is that this is proven even in the thermodynamic limit. Most of the things in Rydberg chain or other systems are done with finite size system. Now, they violate ETH and, uh, okay, so the uh, entropy, as I said, goes as log L. Uh, the point is, which is important for our consideration, is that they usually form a closed subspace in the Hilbert space, at least in the context of Rydberg chain, and they do not have significant overlap with other ETH obeying states, which are right uh, here. This means that if you are looking at a dynamics of <coughs> system, sorry, starting from a state where, uh, you know, which has large overlap with these cars, your dynamics is going to move in this closed subspace. And, consider, and as a result, you are going to have long time oscillations. The system simply doesn't thermalize because cars which control these dynamics are not thermal states. And you have little leakage to the ETH band, the thermal states, because the cars do not have big overlap with these ETH states, okay? However, uh, one thing to note is that uh, it really matters if you start from a state which, is, uh, which has large overlap with these cars. Here is one example where you start with a state which has large overlap with cars and you see this long time dynamics. But if you start with a state which doesn't have large overlap with cars in the same system, you see that there is very rapid, rapid thermalization and you get the ETH predicted value. So this is all known and people have studied this for our, um, you know, typical quench experiments where you prepare a state, start from a state which is known to have large overlap with stars. And for this Rydberg chains, thankfully it's easy to prepare those states experimentally. And they have seen this long time oscillations. And this was of course motivated by this experiment on this Rydberg chain where you take a bunch of Rydberg atoms on a chain which can have two states. One is the ground state and the other is the Rydberg excited states. And these are typical 87 rubidium atoms. Now the interaction between these two atoms in their excited or Rydberg states is denoted by V and it's a dipole interaction which can be pretty strong, but it's a tunable parameter in the experiment. You can actually tune this uh, V. And there is other thing that one can tune is the detuning parameter, which is essentially uh, the ease at v with which you could put an a Rydberg atom in a ground state. So here, people typically tune this Vij so that uh, interaction between two adjacent Rydberg atoms is very large and positive, so that people, uh, so that the system typically avoids having two Rydberg atoms on neighboring sites. On the other hand, the detuning parameter is also large, so that uh, you want to perform, uh, you want to put as many Rydberg atoms, uh, as many atoms in the Rydberg states as possible. So under those conditions, you get into what is called the Z2 order state because the, because, uh, you know, Rydberg excitations are formed at every other alternate site. 
And in the experiment that uh, threw up this surprise, is that one started from this Z2, Z2 ordered state and essentially quenched the detuning parameter to this paramagnetic regime where there are no read bug excitations. Uh, and then one saw this long term coherent oscillation of uh, the domain wall density, which is basically the some kind of density density correlation function or density expectation value of these read bug atoms. And essentially, uh, there is a, this constitutes an experimental signature for weak violation of ETH, weak because you need to start from a given state, and um, violation of ETH because in, within this time scale, according to standard prediction of ETH in this system, the system should have thermalized, but it doesn't. So now, with this background, what I'm going to do is to take up this model uh, the dipole model, which describes the low energy properties of these read bug chains, and study its periodic dynamics. Okay. So the first uh, thing that uh, I want to do is to describe this dipole model. It's a very simple model, which contains a chemical potential lambda, which tells you how easy or hard it is to sort of, uh, you know, uh, so uh, which tells you the on-site energy of these dipoles. And then there is a number non-conserving term, the dipoles, uh, in this model, the dipoles can be spontaneously created or destroyed. Now, this simple looking Hamiltonian becomes non-integrable because of the presence of these constraints. The first one is that the number of dipoles per site should be less than one, and the second is that there could be no two dipoles at neighboring sites. And uh, these turned out to be the effective low energy model of a tilted bose hubbard model. So if you take a bose hubbard model and tilt it with an electric field, it turns out that the effective low energy model for this is just these dipoles. This was done by Subir, myself, and Steve long time back. But uh, co coming back to this model in context of these dipoles, the presence of the constraint is what makes the model non-integrable, and that's very important to remember. Now, this model has a straightforward representation in terms of the Ising spin because you can map these dipoles, which uh, since there are only one dipole per site, you can map these dipoles to some Ising spins. And you can also implement the second constraint of having not, uh, not having two neighboring dipoles by a projection operator, okay? uh, which is given by this. So you see that this projection operator would annihilate the state if there is a spin up, which corresponds to occupied dipole. So using this projection operator, one can write down the spin equivalent of this dipole model, which has a sigma z l term with a lambda, and then w comes with now the sigma x, but flanked with this projection operators on neighboring sides. Okay. When lambda is equal to zero, this is called the PXP model, and this is known to host scars, uh, which is known from earlier works. So uh, the idea is that uh, you know in the limit lambda tending to zero, we know that the Hilbert space of this Hamiltonian hosts scars. Okay. Now this model also provides a uh, low energy effective model for the read bug stuff and that is immediately seen from here. So if you tune your VIJ such that you don't have neighboring, uh, you cannot have neighboring dipole, uh, read bug excitations, then this can act as a constraint and you can implement this constraint using this projection operator which takes you to this. The delta being mapped to lambda by two and omega being mapped to w. So that's a straightforward mapping. So uh, it is expected that uh, you know the calculation based on this model would have some um, implication for the experiments. So now I'm going to talk about periodically driving this model. And we are going to study a simple square pulse protocol because that's the simplest to do. And what we are going to do is to sort of make lambda a function of time. Uh, this is a square pulse where on one half of the pulse lambda is, uh, lambda of t is minus lambda and in the second half it's plus lambda and so on. So the unitary evolution operator can be written in this form and if I, uh, so we use an exact diagonalization to get the energy eigenstates and eigenvalues for h of lambda and h of minus lambda. We denote them by epsilon plus and epsilon minus. And the unitary evolution operator can be expressed in form of them. Once you know this, you can calculate expectation of any operator. And we are going to be interested in the density-density correlation, <coughs> NL and NL plus two. And it really doesn't matter which L you start with. I mean, it's uh, translationally invariant. So uh, this is what we are going to compute, okay? So also, because we know U, we also numerically know the Fluke Hamiltonian. 
and um, so one can combine, sort of, you know, uh, use that in subsequent calculation. Okay, so this is the numerical part. Analytically, what we can do, the first thing that one does with this kind of problem is to see a Magnus or a high frequency expansion. And this is easy to do here. So, you know, there is the standard terminology. Uh, so, uh, you can define this, um, you can define this Hamiltonian in units of T and, you know, just expand this. This is a standard Magnus expansion. And it turns out that once you do this calculation, the Magnus expansion yields two different type of terms. The first one, which is the high, uh, which is proportional to W here, and then there are these terms out there. Here, gamma essentially is lambda measured in units of frequency, and delta is W measured in units of frequency. So there is a class of terms, which is this renormalized PXP, because you see that it still has this sigma x kind of term, and there is a sigma y, but if you just make a simple rotation, you could think of this to be a PXP model. And, uh, but then there are these non-PXP terms, which occurs in higher orders of delta. Okay, so the Hamiltonian has both. And the thing to see is that if you are at high frequency, then uh, is the PXP terms which dominates. Okay, that's the dominating term. Now, for large gamma, um, so we are going to be in the limit where this coefficient, the drive amplitude is large compared to the coefficient of the PXP term. And in this language, it turns to the limit, it uh, translates to the limit gamma much, much greater than delta. So one can do this Magnus expansion to higher orders in delta over gamma. And, uh, you know, so it turns out that this sum series can be resummed. And if you resum this series, you just get this form. Uh, of course, we derived it in a different way. We just didn't stare at this and guess this form. We couldn't, uh, you know, uh, but, the, but, but the point is that, so I'm going to show you how to derive this, but the point is that uh, it turns out that this happens to be one example where in a many body system, you could, at least in the limit where W over lambda is a small parameter, you could get a Magnus expansion which is valid for any frequency. We, we could get a Fluke Hamiltonian which is valid for any frequency. And it produces the Magnus expansion exactly. So, and this is how you do it. The key thing to note is that if you take two terms in the Hamiltonian, which are at different sites, their commutator essentially uh, is order W square. And therefore, if you are only looking at order W terms in the Hamiltonian, you can do a very simple on-site calculation, and it just gives you the right result. It's really trivial. This, is, this can also be done by doing a Fluke perturbation theory. But uh, it gives the same result, you know, at the end of the day. So now, with this uh, background, let me come to dynamics of the correlation function. And what we do is the following. We start with the initial state, which is the Z2 state, that is one dipole per site. But instead of taking just the Z2 state, we superpose it with its time reverse counterpart, which is Z2 bar. And the reason we do it is that then we can use the symmetry um, sectors and do our calculation, which allows us to sort of go into much larger n. So the largest system size that we can tackle by doing this is 26, I believe. And uh, without it, we would be restricted to L equal to 18 or something. Okay, so the thing that we see is that at high frequency, uh, you know, uh, the Fluke Hamiltonian is just some time average PXP model. And there you see this card induced oscillation. At very low frequency, the Fluke Hamiltonian, we do not really know what that is, but the point is that that's expected to be a very complicated beast, and it can even be long range, and it is expected that this is not going to host cars, and that's what we see, it doesn't. You see ETH type thermalization. However, what is, and in, for the large frequency, we see the presence of these car states through calculation of half chain entanglement entropy, and at low frequency, we do not see that. Okay, so everything uh, which participates in the dynamics, which are these red dots, has gone into the ETH band. Now, the interesting thing here is that uh, when we look at the intermediate frequency, it turns out that uh, there is some non-monotonicity because we see oscillation at lower frequencies and no oscillations at higher frequencies, and we are trying to sort of understand those. But before going into that, let's just look at the high frequency regime where this lambda over omega is less than one. 
Okay, here uh, the Magnus expansion works and what we see is that the frequency of the response is very close to the frequency of the scars, which is another sort of uh, verification that it's indeed scars which dominates the dynamics. And um, here also the non-PXP terms are insignificant. So the PXP terms and hence scars dominate the entire dynamics. But the real interesting thing happens in the intermediate frequency regime. So uh, suppose I start driving this system and we are at some omega and this is in units of W or rather square root of 2W for some weird reason. But never mind that. Uh, suppose you are at this, you see that there is a oscillatory behavior where the dynamics is decomposed, to, uh, where, where sort of, uh, where the dynamics is due to the scars out here. And then as you reduce your frequency, you see that thermalization sets in and here you have the first stage thermalization. But as you go out to lower frequency, the coherence comes back again. So there is this, you know, thermal regimes which is flanked by two coherent regimes right there. And we find several such transitions or crossovers, whatever you want to call them. And uh, they occur in this intermediate frequency regime. And um, so that this thermalization behavior is consistent with ETH where this is scar induced oscillation. So there is a clear tuning. So this shows that you can tune the response of your system, at least for this initial starting state, by using the drive frequency. And this is, this constitutes fluke engineering of scars because uh, depending on the drive frequency, the scars are either there or not there and they either control the dynamics or ETH sets in. So, and here is the phase diagram, okay? So if I draw this phase diagram in the lambda omega d plane, you see that there are these bands where thermal behavior sets in and the white regions are the coherent regime. And essentially what happens is that uh, as you go lower in frequency, these regions become really dense and they fill up the entire phase diagram and where thermalization sets in. So at very low frequency, it's all thermal. At very high frequency, it's all oscillations, but in between there are several reentrant changes from coherent to thermal behavior. Okay, so this gives us the possibility of uh, tuning coherence in a driven many body system as a function of both the drive frequency and the drive amplitude. So that's the main result here. So let me now move into another part which is uh, not written up yet, but uh, let me tell you about this anyway. So this constitutes noisy dynamics. So what happens, what we do is that we now consider a square pulse protocol, but with a random period. And this randomness is uh, sort of like a telegraph noise where, you know, this alpha, which tells you uh, uh, is a random number which takes value plus or minus one, and dt is the amplitude of noise. Now, if I think of uh, evolution of this state, the starting state, what happens is that I have a random string of this u pluses and u minuses, you know, in a completely random sequence. And uh, so this corresponds to this, um, uh, so this gives you the final state and then you can sort of uh, obtain the expectation value of again, this sigma z operator, this same correlator, essentially um, in this dynamics. So the first thing that I would like you to note is that uh, for each of the pulse, uh, time period t plus and t minus individually, you still have a fluke Hamiltonian because it's a periodic stuff. And that is given by still the first leading order term of this Fluke Hamiltonian is still given by this form with gamma replaced by either gamma plus or gamma minus, depending on whether you have a time period T plus or T minus. So that's the, because you know, if you have a U plus, the time period is T plus and so gamma which has T now has to have T plus and so on. So this gamma plus or minus is just this lambda times the time period and uh, this d gamma is defined as lambda times the noise amplitude divided by 4h. So the effect of, so now you can ask yourself in a question that if you keep on driving this, how does the effect of randomness come in? The first thing to note is that if u plus and u minus would have commuted, you could have just taken them in pairs because it's a long string and they are equally probable. And then the dynamics would have gone through some average effective u. You know, and that is not random. So the effect of randomness is manifested in dynamics through randomization of the fluke eigenvector due to non-commutivity of u plus and u minus. And when you actually take this idea and do a calculation, 
you could show that the kind of terms this non-commutator gives essentially is going to take you from this, so for example, from the SCART to uh, thermal subspace and so on. But no, noting this, suppose we try to call, calculate this commutator, at least to leading order, we can calculate this commutator. And uh, the one sees that the norm of this commutator, which is given by this, vanishes at special point in the, uh, in the, in the parameter space, okay. And when, and, and at this special point when C vanishes, your dynamics essentially is roughly, you know, sort of propagated by this average Fluke Hamiltonian, which also one can calculate. That's just H plus T plus by H minus T minus divided by twice T. And that's just the, you know, so you group these two U plus and U minus together and get an effective average Fluke Hamiltonian from that. And uh, if you want coherent oscillation in your system, which you can now expect because C has gone to zero, the randomness, effect of randomness has gone to zero, you also need that the norm of this Fluke Hamiltonian, the leading term, must be non-zero. Because after all, this leading term needs to host cars for you to have beat ETH and have this long time coherent oscillation. And that condition is given by this, okay. But it's much seen pictorially where you can plot this commutator as a function of the noise amplitude and the time period and, uh, uh, T. And here you can do the same for the average Hamiltonian. And so for example, if you are at gamma equal to pi, which is the thermal, the first thermalization point in the non-random drive. As you increase the noise, you see that the effect of the commutator becomes large and then there is around 0.5, there is a regime out here where it's small. And here, uh, around 0.5, you see that the norm of the average Hamiltonian is large. So that's one point where you expect that in spite of the presence of noise, you are going to have long-term coherent oscillation. This is something, and this phase diagram essentially gives you an analytical prediction of all regions, you know, where this can happen. So wherever this thing is dark and this thing is bright yellow, that's the region where you expect for this kind of uh, uh, coherent oscillation in spite of the presence of noise to happen. And this is what we see from exact, uh, uh, from our calculation of exact uh, diagonalization. So you see that uh, if I am around gamma equal to pi, which is the first thermalization point, when I don't have a noise, I have very fast thermalization. I increase this thing, there are some short term noise, but you still see thermal behavior, but right around 0.5, where this commutator vanishes, you see that there is very long term oscillation. And this is also the exact, uh, norms of the commutator. What I showed you in the previous slide was from the analytical stuff, which is the leading terms. Here it's uh, the exact term, uh, stuff computed from exact diagonalization numerically. And you see that uh, this red line which gives you the uh, average, which gives you the norm of u plus u minus, which is sort of like the average Hamiltonian, uh, is peaked around 0.5. However, the commutator, which is uh, norm, essentially, which is this black line goes to zero. Okay. So that's one example where in spite of having, in fact, where noise essentially brings in coherence in a driven system. Quite counterintuitive, but that's what we have. So you could do the same thing around gamma equal to 2 pi. And here, essentially, you see that there are two points where the noise almost vanishes, which is around 0.25 and 0.75. And here there is one thing that the uh, coherent oscillations and 0.75 decays faster, much faster than that around 0.25. And that's because the norm of the commutator is almost zero, but not quite. And this, of course, uh, is beyond the leading order theory because the leading order theory would predict vanishing of this norm both at 0.25 and 0.35, uh, uh, sorry, 0.75, the noise amplitude. However, the other terms which are higher order whose analytical forms we do not know essentially shows that uh, around 0.75 there is a larger value of the residual terms of the commutator and therefore the thermalization is fast. Here interestingly the norm of the commutator also vanishes when you are at dt by t equal to 0.5. However, here the Fluke Hamiltonian, average Fluke Hamiltonian also vanishes. And therefore, you don't see this coherent oscillation. It's still thermal. This is as expected from ETH. 
So, uh, so the statement is that you know noise can induce long term coherent oscillations in this kind of systems and uh, we have also worked out the what happens when you drive this with quasi periodic drives something with a few more sequence, but uh, I am not going to talk about that today, it's still work needs to be done there. So here is the conclusion. So we saw that quantum scars play a central role in dynamics of correlators of lead bug excitations. And uh, for periodic drives at high frequency, the dynamics mimics quench. However, at intermediate frequency, you have these transitions from thermal to coherent behavior. And most interestingly, uh, one can find noise induced coherent oscillations in these systems. So I think I'm going to stop here and thank you for your attention. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. I had a question generally about uh, what's known about SCARI systems. Uh, how, how does the number of SCAR states scale with the increase in system size? Do you know? Uh, I don't have this at the top of my head, no. Uh, in our case, the subsystem is of the order of L. I mean, the number of SCARs would go like that, but in general, I don't know. Roughly linearly, you would say. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, so I know that in the thermodynamic limit, this would be a tiny fraction, an insignificant fraction of the total Hilbert space. And most likely it's some power of L, but I don't know the exact power. I mean, in our case, it roughly goes as L. I have one more question. Yeah, sure, okay. please. So, so there are two settings where I keep seeing these Kari states. One is um, the AKLT-like states, which seem to be just a regular spin chain for yeah, sure. all productive purposes. And the other one is the, are these Rydberg blockade and yeah. constraint Hilbert space. That's right. System. So, which of these two things have some kind of robustness to parameters? Like, uh, here actually, so in the so I can only tell you about this um, read bug thing. The here, of course, if you are um, looking at the standard Hamiltonian of the system, the scars are present on a very tiny corner, where around lambda equal to zero. Well, dynamics, what it does is to extend this behavior using Fluke Hamiltonian in a much more parameter space. Uh, the, and one more comment is that the reason why people study this is that in this thing, it turns out that there are some experimentally realizable states which has large overlap with this car subspace and so you can sort of uh, meaningfully look at the dynamics of this. In the AKLT spin chain, constructing those states are very difficult. So seeing the effect of scars in dynamics is much harder there compared to what we have. Yeah, Torun. <coughs> was there a symmetry reason that when you were changing frequency, that the, the special state remained? You were taking the same special state, I guess? This, mm, that sorry, work? could you repeat that? I couldn't. So, so there was, as you mentioned, you need to take this special initial state to, to see this. Z2 and Z2 bar? Right. So, so, so yeah, that. So, so we are but, looking at the dynamics in the k equal to zero sector, and you can do that only if you take that. Otherwise, you could do the dynamics and you are going to get roughly the same result. But the point is, in numerics, you cannot really go to larger system size. Hmm. Because you don't have that symmetry constant imposed. So that I understand it has this symmetry. But um, I'm just trying to, what's a general statement of which initial states uh, in, in your system will? Well, the requirement is that here, normally, what you see is that uh, you need the Z2 state or Z2 plus Z2 bar, whatever it is. And the, the requirement is that they have large overlap with this car manifold. That's what I'm asking. Was there a, uh, you were changing frequency, so your Flocke Hamiltonian was changing. Yeah. Was there a reason that the Z2 states retained its special status mm, as you were changing? Uh, the reason probably is that for a large uh, range of frequency, you know, the effective Fluke Hamiltonian is PXP-like. Okay, it okay, didn't so, change. And the scars okay. which are formed is okay. roughly the right. PXP scars. Yeah, that's for the leading term, yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, so just right. one comment there that although, you know, uh, we need to start from the Z2 state, the zero state also shows some very interesting phenomenon which I haven't shown here, but it's there. I mean, it's not there for, you know, standard Hamiltonian, but if you do driven dynamics, some very interesting stuff comes in there, including this coherent oscillations. Is it uh, clear that this is this uh, these car state would survive in any? 
it obvious that it not to me here not to me but in the aklt chain people have shown analytically that it will but the here i don't really know and the second point is that the more i think pertinent question is that even if they survive what would be their effect on dynamics you know how much uh, they would matter because this would be a really really tiny fraction of the total hilbert space so uh, i don't really know and also there is this other thing that eth is supposed to hold in the thermodynamic limit so dynamics would probably not be controlled by scars for very long time within that is it possible to start with some many body states many body hamilton where there are no scars mm -hmm. and create scars through driving in principle yes yeah you could mm -hmm. design things like that because the fluke hamiltonian could be much more complicated compared to uh, yeah sure please so Krishnindu was talking of the dynamics of the zero states. So for the they undriven the problem, there are no scars. But when you drive it, due to these non-PXP terms, you induce scars even for the zero states. So. Right. And we still don't understand why that happens. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? All right. If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And I think